Blessings in the beautiful and bountiful name of Jesus Christ. We want to welcome you all to our time and study as we continue um, in our uh, deep dive into the uh, book of Chronicles, the se uh, first and second uh, book of Chronicles. Uh, we're in Second Chronicles, I think it's chapter 17, week 9 in our book. Uh, we're going to catch up, uh, if you would, from we took a little break for our 40 days of fasting and praying, but I'm excited to get back into this, and I think uh, uh, it's going to open up for some continued discussion, but also it's going to open us up and get us prepared for, <clears throat> for what God has for us next. So we're going to get right into it. We're going to ask if Dr. Lewis would open us up in a word of prayer. And then we're going to turn it over to Dr. Norwood, and we'll and we'll get right into our time and study. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Thank you, God, for allowing us to come out once again to study Your Word. Thank you, God, for just being so good to us, God. Just continue to bless us and keep us, and God, just bless our pastor, bless his wife, and bless his family, and. Bless everyone in our congregation. God, you know, again, we have suffered another loss in our congregation, but God, just continue to hold that family up. Mm. Bless the Nichols family and bless Mother Ada and just bless anyone else that is hurting and needs your support right now. Mm. And God, just continue to bless our world. We know we've had lots of shootings in our community and bless our young people as they are falling away from you. And just let us, God, to be an encouragement to them. And God, just continue to bless the sick and afflicted all over this land and country. And God, just bless our study tonight. And whatever your will is for our lives, God, let it be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Brother Gerald. Before we get started, so that we can get acclimated to where we're at, I would like to take just a little time to go review a little bit of Chronicles and how we got to where we're at, and then we'll try to get into this chapter, Jehoshaphat. If you all remember in our studies of Chronicles that this is another view of the books of King, First Sec Kings, uh, Samuel. We've heard these names before, but this person is wanting to make sure that he sets Israel or the children of Israel on the right path. So he re organized all the history all the way back to Adam and Eve and said this is the way if we did it right this is the way it should have gone and so he looks at the the, the negligences of all the kings starts with David didn't give him as much notoriety as the book of Kings and Samuel do but he gives him an important place in the genealogy and moving forward as to the way the world should have gone if they would have done it right in terms of following God then he did, spends a lot of time with Solomon. Solomon becomes the poster child, the ideal type of leader, the one that consults God before he moves forward, that he's enabled to, whenever issues occur, he makes sure he's in alignment with God. And that becomes a blessing for him to be not only great like his, his father, but he does the things correctly. And then even so, with men and women doing the right things, sometimes we fail. This book is also shows you how we can recover if we are just steadfast on following God, that he does recognize man's sin, because this is part of the ultimate plan. Down the road, Christ, as we've just gone through, will come about, and he'll take care of our shortcomings, but it gives us a chance to see how we, even in failing, if we do it and we keep in relationship with God, connected to the true vine, that he is able to forgive us and help us even overcome things that we would think not even be possible that ends up the way he wants it to. So that's kind of the gist of it. <clears throat> I'm going to read this section here uh, for you. It says, and these are the issues that these leaders, as poster people, to me they just rep represent the characteristic of human beings. They still happen in a leadership position. That we have good intentions, we try to do the right thing, but due to whatever besets us, it could be who we marry, it could be who we become friends with, uh, it, it could be a number of different things, a position that we get. Sometimes we allow that become idolatry and it starts taking over what God wants us to do. Uh, <clears throat> so that's what we want to look at because then we can mirror it in our own lives 
to see how even if leaders do this and who are supposed to be of God, how it could affect us individually so we can make corrections appropriately. It says serving God, this is before your chapter in this is a previous chapter, it says serving God versus serving man. Mm. You remember right after David died, uh, his son Solomon was able to keep things together. There was uh, the holisticness of Israel, north and southern kingdom. They start calling it Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Uh, Solomon was able to keep that pretty much together until a new leader kind of started pulling things apart. Rehoboam said, yeah, we don't want to have to follow David. We want our own way to do things, which is human nature. And so they started doing it. And so all of a sudden, idolatry kicks in. They start accepting things from outside. And they lose that connection to the point that Judah almost becomes the true follower of, of God. And the northern kingdom, Israel, is the one that breaks away. That continues the history even into Jesus' day. Because that's where all of the uh, people come from in the northern kingdom that are against God. That Christ is going to try to rehabilitate um, and bring them back. So that's because it begins then, it continues on even to Christ's day. So it is a southern kingdom where Jerusalem is that takes on this is the area and the leadership under Solomon, under some of these other kings, would be fallen God. But even after Solomon, who is there to try to do it the right way and ask for consulting, his descendants began to experiment with uh, creating God, if you will, in their own image. They begin to do some things. And it may be something as simple as they caution people about is who you marry. We know even with Adam and Eve and Job, these were women of their own same ethnicity and religion. But there's that quotation that says, be careful in terms of your acquaintance or your relationship that you don't marry uh, unequally, unequally yoked. That means not by the, the person's sex there or age or what am I, but their connection religiously because there's a chance that as it is when human nature, women have had influence on their husband, pull them away from where they're at. So they caution them that. That occurs with some of these kings. And the king that we're going to be talking about today, Jehoshaphat, is one that took a chance. He does a good job, but he took a chance. He ends up uh, being uh, espoused to Ahab, the king of the northern kingdom, his daughter. So it, it presents some issues to the point where he has to be cautionary as to how he moves about. And then who you befriend. You know, they were trying to be friends with these northern kingdom. Ahab was was an important king at the time. They were trying to be friends with him. But at the same time, you know, depends on your strength. Somebody can have more influence on you if you're not strong enough in your own belief. And so we'll see some indications of that. We want to read the background, and we probably have to read the scripture. We're going to read it out loud so you can hear and listen as we're going through some of these questions and answers to get a better understanding. So what we're going to do today, we've gone from David and Solomon, kind of the ideal people out, how this chronicler is want us to see how God wants his leaders, to then their descendants, some of them fall apart and do the wrong things, now to even more descendants. This particular Jehoshaphat is the son of Asa. And Asa, if you know the story of him, at the very end of his life, after not obeying God, ends up leave, losing the ability to his feet, diseased feet. So he fails. We're going to see what this man, Jehoshaphat, does in getting himself realigned. I think you'll be surprised. He does a pretty good job. I'm going to re we'll read the background here. It says the place, in your, those that have the book, the place of the passage. After relating the failure of Asa in his old age, the chronicler introduces us to Asa's son, Jehoshaphat. The story of Jehoshaphat is significantly expanded here from the version we find in the, the book of Kings. Clearly, the chronicler wants us to pay attention to this king. Despite some failings, Jehoshaphat is a model for the uh, attention to, uh, the model for the chronicler of a king who walks in the ways of David and Solomon. Jehoshaphat reforms Judah, the southern kingdom that's doing what God has asked, worship and responds to difficulty in his life by calling out to the Lord for help. 
And that's one of the immediate identifiers that he's different from some of the other. He's more like Solomon. You remember that's what God was pleased with with Solomon? Before he even took it over after his dad died, he said, I want you to be involved. I want to know how to rule these people. Help me. And that's important for us to see how a leader does it. And God is looking for, as we go through this and read this next section, he's looking for kings not only follow him, but in their following, they also provide the right type of leadership to the people, that they don't take disadvantage of people, uh, take advantage of people, that they make sure people are treated right, the widowers, everybody that's uh, children. And he's looking for how they cascade his rulership and doing the right thing to the people that they are supposed to be subject to or subject to them. So that's important. We want to look for how he does a good job in that. So it's not only just following God. If you follow God, it should be seen in your actions, what you do with people, if you're in a leadership role or if you work with each other. We should see some way or other that you are doing God's will. Let me say this, Gerald, too, because I want to make sure that we understand even though we're in the Old Testament now and we're seeing how God is pulling these leaders together and how God is like even talking with uh, uh, Solomon and uh, uh, Jehoshaphat now. When we get to Jesus, he says the same thing. He says that you will not be like the others. You will not lord your authority over the people. You will be amongst them. You were, and even when he called the uh, deacons and when the other apostles, he said, look, you need to bring out men from among you that are of good rapport. God wants us to be relational. God wants his leaders to be relational. See, too often, especially today, and even in our churches today and with our pastors today, and it's one thing that, I mean, it just really gets to me. When you have a, a pastor or a leader that is untouchable or unreachable, should I say, that is unapproachable, that, you know, uh, I've known some that once they finish preaching, they're gone. They don't spend no time with the congregation. If they... If the church is having a fellowship, the pastor is nowhere around. That's not what God wants. God wants all of us. He made us to, he said it's not good for man to be alone. That's not just talking about husband and wife. That's talking about all mankind. It's not good for us to be alone. He, he did not make us to stand alone. No matter what your position, no matter what your title, He's not, he did not, did not make us or design us to be alone. That's it. Okay. So th that last section we'll read, and then if you if you like, would you like to read that last section for me? Oh, sure. The oh. big picture? Yeah, sure, because I want to come out. <clears throat> <clears throat> the chronicler shows us Jehoshaphat as an example of a king who brings people back to mm, the Lord, mm. reforms worship, establishes justice, and depends on the Lord's help. Although he sins by allying himself with God's enemy, the overall pattern of Jehoshaphat's life is dependence on God, and he is blessed as a result. Amen. So you can see that in God's plan, it's holistic. It involves how we're governed, to be governed. These are our leader. And it even gives you a particular opportunity. That's why you should even pray for your leaders, that they do it the right way. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is all about, our participation in it, what they should be doing. And if they are a true leader, whether it be from pastors to leaders of the country, that's why Jesus has no problem with saying to, you know, give unto Caesar, that is Caesar. He believes in order too. But at the same time, he knows that we must pray for those who are in leadership role. We know that through all the scriptures that we read from the disciples and that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah, Dr. Lewis. Um, you know, I, re I really like this studying of these kings because, you know, the, it's important to, for us to look at leadership in a, 
many different levels. Mm -hmm. um, Jehoshaphat is important in, in all these kings that we're going to talk about. But they institute policies and procedures mm -hmm. about he restores and reforms the worship because he takes down the idols. Mm -hmm. But you know, we often think about leaders in high positions. But he but God also wants us to be leaders in our homes. That's right. That's right. Because, you know, the reason why societies are like they are is because societies are built from the home. So if you're not a leader in your home, then it spills out into society. That's right. That's right. So everyone has to be a leader in their own household. So that's why I like it when Joshua says, as for me and my, my house, house. Mm -hmm. we are going to serve the Lord. And mm -hmm. so it starts from the top, if you're a governor mm -hmm. or you're a king in this case, of saying, we're going to tear down the groves and we're going to worship God like we said we were going to do. Mm -hmm. So then that translates down into your own home, mm -hmm. you and your family. We're going to serve God. You're going to get up on Sunday morning. You're going to go to church, everybody that's in here. You know, just back to Rahab. Mm -hmm. She was the head of her household, and mm -hmm. everybody that was in there was saved. Mm -hmm. So whoever's the head of the household, mm -hmm. you know, dog, That's cat, That's woman, mm -hmm. male, whoever, mm -hmm. everybody in here, y'all going to church. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you just got in here at 4 a.m., you're going to church. Mm -hmm. So that's how leadership is demonstrated no matter where it starts. Mm -hmm. From the government on down. Mm -hmm. Any other comment? Anybody else? You want something? Because you said a good word there. I mean, leadership is demonstrated. See, and those of us that have been in the military and that have gone through leadership training, one of the things that they teach us in leadership training is that if you're going to be a good leader, you have to learn how to do what? Follow. Follow. See, see, to... The way I have developed into a leader is because I've watched and been trained by leaders. And I watched them and studied them. I followed them. If you're ever going to be a good leader, you have to learn how to follow. If you're not going to follow anyone, you'll never be a leader. And so now, who is the one that we all are to follow. Christ-like. Come on now. And now he is the perfect leader. He is the one that never made a mistake. So as we follow him, and that's what I tried to say Sunday, I don't know if I came across right, but as long as we follow Jesus, everything is going to work out. Now, that's not to say that we ain't going, that, that, that we'll be perfect in everything we do. We're going to stumble and we're going to fall. We're going to get it messed up. But you know what? As long as we put forth that effort to the best of our ability to follow Jesus, that's all he asks for. That's all he asks for. That's it. There you go. There you go. We may want to, what we want to do now is to read the scripture so we can see how this man performed the ideal leadership role and it helps us to understand what we're just going through, how we should be looking at our own lives and whatever role we're playing. What is leadership made of? Pastor Shader brought an important point. Most people think leaders are just trying to be a leader, and we'll find that out even in our giftedness classes. Some people are leaders, and some people are not as good as a leader, but in leadership, you do have to be a good follower because that's what leadership does. It allows you to be better at helping someone if you know how you felt when you were being trying to be yes, So we're going to read the verses here, uh, the 17th chapter, verses 1 uh, through 18 uh, and the 34th verse. Okay. Well, I just got all the 17. That's right. Okay. That's right. All right. Just listen to. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Just listen to his. Um, I got it in my ear. <laughs> you, got, you have it? Yeah, I got it. I just got this thing, you know. I wear so much I forget I have it on. And what, well, while he's doing it, he want to just listen to some the things that, this again, this is a, a king. He has the ability to do whatever he wants to, but listen to what he's willing to do 
with no coercion. He does it voluntarily. God likes that kind of attitude. He liked it with Solomon, too. Chapter 17. Jehoshaphat, his son, succeeded him as king and strengthened himself against Israel. He stationed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and put garrisons in Judah and in the towns of Ephraim that his father Asa had captured. The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. He did not consult the Baals, but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. The Lord established the kingdom under his control, and all Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat so that he had great wealth and honor. His heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, he removed the high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. In the third year of his reign, he sent his officials, Ben-Hael, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nathanael, and Micaiah, to teach in the towns of Judah. With them were certain Levites, Shemaiah, Nathaniah, Zebediah, Azahel, Shemiramoth, Jehonathan, Adonijah, Tobijah, and Tob Adonijah, and the priests, Elishama and Jehoram. They taught throughout Judah, taking with them the book of the law of the Lord. They went around to all the towns of Judah and taught the people. The fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the land surrounding Judah, so that they did not go to war against Jehoshaphat. Some Philistines brought Jehoshaphat gifts and silver as tribute, and the Arabs brought him flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 goats. Jehoshaphat became more and more powerful. He built forts and store cities in Judah and had large supplies in the towns of Judah. He also kept experienced fighting men in Jerusalem. Their enrollment by families was as follows. From Judah, commanders of units of 1,000. Adna the commander with 300,000 fighting men. Next, Jehohanan the commander with 280,000. Next, Amasiah son of Zikri, who volunteered himself for the service of the Lord with 200,000. From Benjamin, Eliada, a valiant soldier, with 200,000 men armed with bows and shields. Next, Jehozabad, with 180,000 men armed for battle. These were the men who served the king, besides those he stationed in the fortified cities throughout Judah. Chapter 8. Okay. So, here is the king that's taken over for, from his father, who has issues, and he starts it out right. He makes sure, and you know, one of the things that some of the previous kings did was the introduction of even in worship, having worship be different, uh, adding music to honor God more, the temple, uh, making sure it was um, spotless in terms of its presentation to God and what they did in it. So here's a king that starts out his leadership as a ruler. He could do whatever he wants to because he's a king, but he chooses to honor God. And even though he has all these things in place, it gives him a sense of strength. When we hear all the soldiers, almost a million soldiers are planted everywhere. Even though he has people in the right place, he has enough sense to know that his power does not come from these things, that they come from God, which is important for us to know. We have no strength. God will allow things to happen for us, but ultimately, he is the source. These are just resources he allows. So he has enough sense to know that. But because he does know that, all of the enemies, we've heard the name Philistines before and how they disrupted David's life and even into Solomon. What are they doing to him? They're bringing him gifts because they don't want him to track on them. <laughs> they see his strength. And what are the other things that are going on, the positive things that are happening? The, the people are behaving correctly. They're doing the right things to make sure God's kingdom moves forward positively. And he makes sure that everybody's in place. Some of the other kings would hire not Levites, which are the true people should be doing these rituals, they were hired whoever they wanted to hire. And they had the thing all upside down. He makes sure the right people designated for the right job are in there. And you know, through our spiritual giftedness, that's kind of the reason I think Pastor Shazer pushes that. Because if we have the right people in the right place doing the right thing, I assure you will have less problem. If you got somebody in the choir that causes a lots of problem, and even though they can sing, they shouldn't be singing because it is the music that produces the element of help, not the voice. That you have, may have people in wrong position. If you have an usher that has a bad time and, and is unable to mask that or make it come out that they present themselves as a positive thing versus a negative, that person may be the wrong person for that position because the, the, the uh, greeter is in, important. 
In fact, the sermon may be preached first there before they ever get to hear there. Amen. If they get turned out there, they may not ever hear the preacher. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we have the right people in the right place. This man made sure that even in the worship service that he was over, that he would place the right people in the right position, doing the right things. So this gives you a sense of the reform that he puts in and that he makes sure that he is not setting things up incorrectly. He wants to make sure that's important. And he's asked God for help to do that. Any other comments, questions? Okay. If you notice about, somebody has some? Go ahead. Um, um, when I was reading this, what, <laughs> you can take it back to your seat there, yeah. Go ahead. Is it on? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, it just came back. Go ahead. What jumped out to me was that uh, even though his family, some was doing right, some was doing bad, but when he got the opportunity, he went to the one who knew, he knew, that could help him. Mm -hmm. So he didn't um, fall on just because I have a title, I have power. Mm -hmm. had a conversation mm -hmm. he went and cleaned house see he took that 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 authority that he got to being king mm -hmm. but he also knew who the authority came from mm -hmm. and he went and cleaned house so when he start from the bottom and he cleaned house and like um brother Gerald said he started putting people that he knew that had the faith and started putting them together. So now I need you to go and put everybody else together. So that's why I'm putting my disciples, I need y'all to go tell the people, we need to get this thing right because the power is God. I'm just, I'm just a vessel that he's using, even though I am the king, but now I need everybody to get in place and let's do what we need to do to honor him, not to honor me. I accept the gifts, but the gifts are not for me. It's gifts are for the Father. And see, and see, the thing about Jeho Jehoshaphat as well is even in uh, the first or uh, the third verse, it said that mm -hmm. the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed. Yes the example of his father's early years and did not worship the image of Baal. See, see, it's something about following the example of a good leader. Now, everybody's going to mess up. Nobody's perfect. No human being is perfect. But when you follow someone, and, and you all have heard me say it before, I learned the good, bad, and the ugly of ministry from my pastor. That's all sides, good, bad, and the ugly. He taught me everything about ministry. That's why nothing about ministry surprises me. He taught me, he, Jehoshaphat learned from his father, and he sought his father's God and obeyed his commands instead of following the practices of the kingdom of Israel. See, it's again about following. And then when you lead, and you lead in a way that the people can see that you have, and this is the word, and y'all going to hear a lot of that coming in the weeks to come, humility. See, it's something about having a level of humility in leadership. It's missing in a whole lot of leaders. A whole lot of leaders lose humility because their head get real big and they think it's all about them. And we have, we have studied some of them in the book of Chronicles. Some leaders who head got too big for them and God had to put them in their place. Yeah. Go ahead, Doc. I love, I love where you're going with this and I, 
and I really, I really am glad that we are studying this. I know I, I was talking to you about this Chronicle book, <laughs> but of course, you know, for me, everything leads back to Jesus. That's right. That's right. And so, as you know, as Gerald has so eloquently put this, that you know, no one is perfect. None of these kings are perfect. And we are just kind of seeing these people as a reflection of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what we see is that, you know, although, of course, you know, I love David. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, Solomon, I know he's all right. Mm. But, you know, <laughs> these kings, none of them are perfect. No, no, no. And none of them can be. Because we were waiting on the king of kings. Mm -hmm. Jesus just came through this line to show you these are human kings with human frailties and we are we are imperfect people right and that's why God sent us a savior so that we could see ourselves that he came to save us and so that he is the true and living king for us to restore this kingdom that he set up for us so this is I mean we're just kind of seeing this pathway mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. is the true king so he's not going to let any of these people be perfect. Oh no, we, oh, no. they can't be. Mm -hmm. They 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 won't they won't be. Mm -hmm. Although you know, of course, I you know I think David is pretty awesome. And had he had a perfect heart, and God said he's a person after my own heart, he wouldn't let him be perfect. No, because mm -hmm. he sent Jesus to fulfill all of these these things to show you, here is the King of Kings. That's it. Here is a true King. Mm -hmm. I'm going to send you the right person to save you from yourselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's it's just nice that we are studying these people that as good as they try to be, and you talked about humility, he sent us somebody that was humble. Oh yeah. Oh, in yeah. Jesus. Oh, yeah. And because all leaders, they do, it's like they always say, power seems to corrupt, corrupt. Mm -hmm. every single person. Mm -hmm. As soon as we get to somebody that's really good, they just, mm -hmm. they mess up. Mm -hmm. Something happens, they, they run off a curve, and it's like, they were doing so good, and then all of a sudden, er, you know, they, they, they just mess up. Because we're getting ready to find out in chapter 18, why did he run off the curve? Well, well and, and uh, even because we see here, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat. It says here in verse 5, it says, So the Lord established Jehoshaphat's control over the kingdom of Judah. All the people of Judah brought gifts to Jehoshaphat, so he became very wealthy and highly esteemed. He was deeply committed to the ways of the Lord. I, I mean, I, I mean, he, I mean, he was bought in. He was all in. But that's what happens. That's why, again, in leadership, it is a, it is a very slippery slope. And you know what? I can even use the song, um, uh, the name of the group. It's a thin line. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's a thin line. I mean, it's a thin line. Because, I mean, you can be loved by one one day and hated by that same one the next day. Jesus was. <laughs> Perfect, example. Perfect example. Perfect example. Perfect example. Pastor Luke. What this reminds me is as we talking and studying this, if you look at it, put yourself That's what you in have here. To do. That's right. And look at your family. Mm -hmm. So the road leads to Jesus. Mm -hmm. But we have to go through the water, the mud, the mountains, the rocks, everything. And our family, some good, some bad. And those that are fallen have have come to give their life to Christ and trying to do the right thing. And like Pastor said, we ain't going to be all perfect, but we make it an effort. So when we make that effort, we're going to try to grab those family members and shake that dust off of them and try to get them in, in the same road we run. You know, the we often, Pastor alluded to, to when he was talking about <clears throat> Uh, the northern kingdom um, and what this man had an opportunity to do. God wants us to, you know, habits are easy learn, good and bad. Mm -hmm. if, if I tell you not to smoke 
and you start out not smoking, that's a good habit, and you probably will refrain from it. If I tell you to smoke, you develop, it becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. So the difference between people that are followers who, again, are not perfect, but it's the attitude that they're in that makes God pleased to them. They assume that they are not responsible for their success. They appreciate where they're at, and they give God total, total uh, uh, reward for it. The northern kingdom, this is how they did it. You, you all probably can catch when I first read when it started. It said, serving God versus serving man. Rehoboam and the people of Israel, that's the northern kingdom, and what they were trying to do in pleasing God, this is how they did it. In his time, learned the hard way about the difference between serving man and serving God. We may think of obeying God as a hard way. We think that his yoke is very heavy instead of as easy. But in fact, it is the way that brings blessing. Jehoshaphat, he's weighed this out and he sees it. When, and so does Job, weighs it out. When, he, when we declare independence from God, we end up enslaved to things that are not God. And such things always prove to be harsh taskmasters. Perhaps we sometimes imagine God as if we were like some of the more judgmental and harsh human masters we may have experienced, but the good news is that we have a God who knows our weakness and forgives our sin. Those who come to him like the prodigal son, mm. glad to be a slave in mm. his household, will discover that he greets them with open arms and accepts them as his own children. That attitude it is not, it's not about me, that I am totally dependent upon God. One thing the pastor Shazer does, I think, and he mentioned it, other ministers, I think helps us understand this more. We have choice, just like the Northern Kingdom, they had a choice to worship God purely, the way that Jehoshaphat is doing, he's putting the right uh, Levites in place, he's making sure he doesn't put, bring idols into the worship. They were mixing idols in, in the Northern Kingdom. They would take Asherah, an idol of another religion because that's what their wives or their friends did and put them in the temple here. Now, we don't do that necessarily, but how we do things can make a difference. One thing the pastor Shazza does, he often tells us, I don't know if you pay attention, that God blesses us when we do it his way and we do it through the means. You notice we don't have a lot of chicken dinners. We don't have a lot of different things. This is a way that things creep in as being, that's what makes you successful. That is what brings it over. Pastor DeShazer relies on, if we do the right thing, God provides. Am I, am I right about what he says? Amen. Is the results there that he does? You hear these stories about $4,000 coming, $2,000, whatever it might be? We didn't raise that through doing any kind of external thing. That's how idolism comes in. That's what these people are trying. They're trying to mix in something that they thought worked over on the other side and mix it into church. Well, maybe God can't do it, but if I do it this way, Jehoshaphat is making sure that he keeps it pure, that he's dependent entirely on God, and that's why he is successful, to the point even his enemy are bringing him gifts because they know God is in control. This shows that God is in control. He's Amen. sovereign. Mm -hmm. He controls everything. If we do it his way, the task may seem difficult that we have to wait on him, but his yoke is easy compared to you having to do it through the chicken dinners, I guarantee you, and you can sleep at night. That's why the yoke is easy to learn of him. It may appear to be more difficult to be obedient, but in the end result, he blesses us, and that's how he does it. Amen, amen. You know, and just listen to this and all that we've talked, and I, uh, I know somebody else got something back there that you want to say, but... It just came to mind to me because we're talking about God in the Old Testament and what he's doing with these kings. But I got to put some Jesus in this because uh, and uh, really the Apostle Paul, as Paul was talking to the Romans, because it came across to me that, you know, the verses says we are not think more highly of ourselves. We are not exalt ourselves. So I went to Romans 12 because I want to. I want to make sure I quote it right, and I don't read it, uh, quote it out of context. And let me just read this before we go on. We still got about um, 15 minutes. But in Romans 12, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. 
Let them, let them be a, whole, a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into the new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, this is Paul talking, I give each of you this warning. <clears throat> Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have, been part, have many parts, each part has a special function. So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Last verse. In, in his grace, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. And it goes on. See, God did it in the old, and he's doing it in the new. And the now. Thank you, Gerald. <laughs> Amen. 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 Okay. Do we want to read 18? 18. Yeah, so, so we get through with week nine. Mm -hmm. it, we have uh, chapter 18. Do you want to finish week nine? Yeah, we could go through 20. 18 does not Do we want to go through 20? That'll be the end. Yeah, it's really nice. I guess it was the nice all the way through 20. 20. Let's go through it a little bit, I guess. So, so you listen. want to go through 18, 18 through 20? Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're saying. That's what you're saying? Yeah, 18 through 20? Yeah. Just be attentive to listen. Now, to Jehoshaphat it. had great wealth and honor, and he allied himself with Ahab by marriage. Some years later, he went down to see Ahab that? in Samaria. Ahab slaughtered many sheep and cattle for him and the people with him and urged him to attack Ramoth Gilead. Ahab, king of Israel, asked Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied, I am as you are, and my people as your people. We will join you in the war. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, First, seek the counsel of the Lord. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, 400 men, and asked them, Shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I not? Go. They answered, For God will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, There is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. <laughs> he is Micaiah, son of Imlah. The king should not say such a thing, Jehoshaphat replied. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imlah, at once. Dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor by the entrance of the gate of Samaria, with all the prophets prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, son of Canaanah, had made iron horns, and he declared, This is what the Lord says. With these you will gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. All the other prophets were prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, the other prophets without exception are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what my God says. When he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead? Or shall I not? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for they will be given into your hand. The king said to him, How many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then Micaiah answered, I saw all Israel 
scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, These people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Didn't I tell you that he never prophesies anything good about me, but only bad? Micaiah continued, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven, standing on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, king of Israel, into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there? One suggested this, and another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked, I will go and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouths of these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, son of Canaan, went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. Which way did the spirit from the Lord go when he went from me to speak to you? He asked. Micaiah replied, You will find out on the day you go to hide in an inner room. The king of Israel then ordered, Take Micaiah and send him back to Ammon, the ruler of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, This is what the king says. Put this fellow in prison and give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely, Micaiah declared. If you ever return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, Mark my words, all you people. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will enter the battle in disguise, but you wear your royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now the king of Aram had ordered his chariot commanders, Do not fight with anyone, small or great, except the king of Israel. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, they thought, This is the king of Israel. So they turned to attack him. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him. God drew them away from him. For when the chariot commanders saw that he was not the king of Israel, they stopped pursuing him. But someone drew his bow at random and hit the king of Israel between the breastplate and the scale arm. The king told the chariot driver, Wheel around and get me out of the fighting. I've been wounded. All day long the battle raged, and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot facing the Arameans until evening. Then, at sunset, he died. Chapter 19 when Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned safely to his palace in Jerusalem, Jehu the seer, the son of Hanani, went out to meet him and said to the king, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is on you. There is, however, some good in you, for you have rid the land of the Asherah poles and have set your heart on seeking God. Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem. And he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim, and turned them back to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. He appointed judges in the land, in each of the fortified cities of Judah. He told them, Consider carefully what you do, because you are not judging for mere mortals, but for the Lord, who is with you whenever you give a verdict. Now let the fear of the Lord be on you. Judge carefully. For with the Lord our God there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. In Jerusalem also, Jehoshaphat appointed some of the Levites, priests and heads of Israelite families, to administer the law of the Lord and to settle disputes. And they lived in Jerusalem. He gave them these orders. You must serve faithfully and wholeheartedly in the fear of the Lord. In every case that comes before you from your people who live in the cities whether bloodshed or other concerns of the law, commands, decrees, or regulations, you are to warn them not to sin against the Lord. Otherwise, his wrath will come on you and your people. Do this, and you will not sin. Amariah, the chief priest, will be over you in any matter concerning the Lord. And Zebediah, son of Ishmael, the leader of the tribe of Judah, will be over you in any matter concerning the king. And the Levites will serve as officials before you. Act with courage, and may the Lord be with those who do well. Chapter 20. We wanted, uh, we wanted to try to 
since there's so much there, so we can absorb that, and if we have to go on the next time to pick it up, we can. Um, what has happened here is that there's a common enemy to Ahab in the northern kingdom and Judah. There's a common enemy, and they have to decide on, Jehoshaphat is trying to decide on, should we mingle together with, again, a nation that is not following God as they should, or do it ourselves. So he consults Ahab. And he does it in the midst of all of his uh, leaders and stuff. And as you heard that story, Ahab, Jehoshaphat asked him, is there anybody here that is still loyal to God that we can ask this question? And he mentions the, the uh, prophet. And the prophet comes, and he kind of gets influenced, too, by all the groups saying that, you know, yeah, you, uh, leader, you're all going to be successful. That's what's going to happen. But the king doesn't even believe him because he knows he tells the truth because his own people are saying he's going to be successful. You know what they said, most likely it's probably not true. So the prophet of Judah, Micaiah, says the same thing. But immediately, he didn't even take a hesitation. He said, what's going to happen? I saw in the vision that things are going to be scattered. The children of Israel, you're just going to lose the war, as he was honest with everybody. So what happened is that when that occurred, then the decision was made, they're going to go ahead and go and do it as Ahab wants it to be done, because he assumes there's going to be victory. He even disguises himself. And they said, be sure, they use the term Israel, that's the northern king, be sure you kill the, the king of the northern king, the Israel king. And he's disguised. They assume it's Jehoshaphat, he's from the southern king. But even in his disguising, he gets a stray arrow and hits him in the chest between the blessed breast, breast. And he tells his, his, his comrade, get me out of here before I get, <laughs> die. So he gets him out of there. So what it says to you that God is sovereign, he's in control, no matter what we try to do, he is going to, and what happens after these battles, they end up getting whatever they're going to get without any fight in some of the cases, without even in warfare. But Jehoshaphat becomes the important person because he wants to do it the right way. He allows himself to go follow. Now, he has a reason. Again, he has a kinship with Ahab. That's his daughter that he's married to. So that's when he's even up in this lesson is saying, be careful about your friend. Don't let your relationship make you forget about God. You still have to be there. Don't let it be a relationship you have from marriage to just even casual. It may be your friend in the church that you say, I want to let that her or him down. If you know it's right, you had better follow that because this is what happens a lot. Well, I just wanted to make a quick comment. <clears throat> I, I, I love how uh, Brother Joel summarized that. But again, you know, God's storyline is going to carry through because, again, Jesus is coming through that. Nothing was going to happen in Joseph's back because his that line is going to come through there mm -hmm. because Jesus has got to come through that southern kingdom. Mm -hmm. So you know God wanted that bad thing to happen to Ahab because he was evil anyway. So he he was going to take Ahab out anyway, and Ahab needed to be taken out because he was evil. But I you know Chronicle <laughs> is really a wonderful book, and if, these are just two verses I want to just highlight in twenty because I know we don't have time to. Um, you know, read 20, but if you go to 20, and I'm reading out of King James, that's what I like, mm. and he says, and uh, 20 and 15, 20 and 15, and he said, hearken ye all, Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. It's the Lord's, that's it. I mean, Chronicle has some nice verses in here. <laughs> Then 2017, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. These are some verses we should have on our wall. <laughs> The well, you, battle is you know, not yours. You know it's, it's God. And we say often, Pastor Shays just said, you know, we want to add Christ in there. That's the reason you sing that song. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what needless pains we bear. Mm -hmm. All because we do not carry everything to him. Everything. And all that. big in prayer. That's what that is saying. We should rely more on him and not fight the battle. Because the battle has already been won. It's the Lord's. And both of those verses that she's uh, read... 
there are songs that have been made. I mean, Yolanda Adams, this battle, this battle is not yours, this the Lord. Then what was the other verse that you read? Verse 17. Verse 17 that says, you will not have to fight this, uh, fight this battle. Take your position and firm uh, deliverance of the Lord. Judah, be not, be not afraid, be not dismayed. Uh, again, these are these are verses that uh, we sing in songs, and they ought to be in our heart because they are true, and they are truth. Especially when you find yourself in a battle, in a storm, in a battle, because that's what life is. And no matter who you are, no matter how old you are, no matter what your position is, you're going to find yourself in something. you either in a storm, just come out of a storm, or on your way going into a storm. It's going to happen. There's a storm out, and it's waiting. It got your name on it. But we know the one that can speak peace. And the storms will behave. The, 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 the waves will cease, the winds will calm, all of that. And you will find comfort in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. I want to thank each and every one of you all for your time tonight. We want to be uh, uh, obedient to the time. We got two minutes over, but we started a little uh, uh, a little late tonight. But again, I thank God for you all. We're going we're gonna to get through this. And then I'm excited because after we finish this, and I'm going to uh, continue to uh, 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 confer with my education directors here. But uh, after this, we're going to do an all-church spiritual gift class, and it's going to be during this hour. And uh, we're going to take everybody through spiritual gifting so that you can know what your spiritual gift uh, is. And uh, it's going to be an exciting time. But, uh, uh, again, we're going to get through this here. We're going to take our time. I think we uh, what, uh, week 10, mm -hmm. and, and, and and this is a 12-week study, so we have uh, three more weeks to go after that. Now, y'all help me, because I think we normally break for summer uh, at the, is it the beginning of May? The, uh, uh, June and July? Because the spiritual gift class is an eight-week study, so I'll look at all of that and see. Yeah, church anniversary is coming up, so we might not get into the spiritual gift class until the fall. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. But, again, it's going to be, and that'll give us time to prepare and get books and get everything all lined up and everything. But, again, I want to thank all of y'all for your time, for your dedication, your commitment to this. This is our time and study. <clears throat> A church is only as strong as it is doing prayer and study. Let us continue to devote ourselves and commit ourselves to prayer and study. Amen? Amen. Amen. Gerald, will you dismiss us in prayer? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that you've allowed us to have this evening and for all those that are present in person and in the virtual world. We thank you for everything you do for us. We thank you for having these scriptures even available for us as a light or the lamp to our feet. We ask you to continue to bless us to understand these things and enable everyone to be able to gain more insight, whatever it is that you're speaking to their heart of, that we can bring these words into reality and become part of our living. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for the leadership he provides. We thank you for all of the leaders of our church, from our deacons to people in finance, the ushers, everybody that performs a role. And we ask to help us be able to see ourselves as a team. Yes, That we're Lord. not yes, individuals, Lord. that we're all working for the same cause. Is to bring someone that's on the outside. When you left here in our resurrection service, when you left here, you said go and go make disciples. Go and make disciples. Mm -hmm. And help us to be able to actualize it in every mm -hmm. effort we do mm -hmm. by doing the right things that people want to know what goes on in here, that they want to be a part of us because of the life we live. We ask you to please help us to see within each other the love for each other, that we need each other every day, and we need to the dependence on each other to carry out your will. We pray for Progressive to continue to bless us financially. We ask you to bless this offering that was taken this evening and help it to be grow into the bush that you are wanting to be by our belief in you that you can do all things even with the faith of a mustard seed. We ask you many blessings on name and sake. Until next time, amen. Amen. Be a blessing to God by being a blessing. <clears throat>
else. In Jesus' name, amen. I got a question. Brother Dale, can I see you for a quick second before you leave? Exactly. But like I said, there's a relationship. The reason he's up there is because he's married to the...